Guten Tag, all my aces, and welcome back. I hope you guys are having a good day. And I thought we should do something special. And that's why I brought out my BF110 E2, Battle of Stalingrad, and we are sitting in a gunner position. Now, why are we sitting in a gunner position, you might ask? Isn't there a lot more action to be had in the pilot seat? Well, yes, if we were flying, but we're not going to be flying today because I want to give you a complete rundown of the gunner position of the BF110. Now you might be asking at this point, is Mark, why is that interesting? Surely, you know, it's just basic stuff. Well, yes and no. There is obviously, you know, the, the most obvious things that you can see here, like the elephant in the room, the MG15 here. And those are things that are self-explanatory. However, at the same time, nobody has ever really done this, I think, you know, taking this time to explain you every little small system in this uh, position and what it means to be a gunner. So if you listen a little bit closely today, you might pick up on a, quite a few things and uh, those will give you mad bragging rights if you happen to uh, be talking to a couple of your friends. So yeah, pay attention. Now as you can see, we are facing rearward. This is obviously the position that the gunner would usually have and we have a nice little seat here. It's also foldable so you can make a little bit more room as you try to move about here. Uh, but obviously as you're flying, uh, this seat is gonna stay down and you're gonna be sitting on it. Now, the good thing about this seat is, as you can see, you can switch very quickly from one position to the other. It's nice and broad and it's also designed that way. And you can put one of your feet, feet there, the other foot there, as you work at the back of this, uh, or actually in the midsection of the aircraft. So the seat itself is essentially doing what it's supposed to do. It doesn't have a backrest, you can't lean yourself on anything, but as a gunner, you could also lean yourself on the side here and, uh, you know, rest your back a little bit that way. Now let's talk a little bit about the gun, shall we? That's what probably interests most people here. And of course, it's an MG-15. Now, these machine guns started appearing in the mid-1920s. And the Germans used them on a lot of their early aircraft as defensive armament. You have Heinke 111s with this gun, you have uh, Junker 88s, you have Dorniers, and you know, it's it's just a very versatile gun. However, obviously, as you can see, you only have one of them. Now, let's talk a little bit more about this gun, shall we? Of course, it fires a 7.92 times 57 mil Mauser, and the gun itself, without the ammo belt, as you can see there, is roughly eight kilos. With the ammo belt, it's 12 kilos or something like that. So it's it's not a light gun, but of course you it's kind of resting on the fuselage and as you swing it about, it's it's gonna be pretty easy. Now it has a rate of fire of roughly a thousand rounds a minute and the muzzle velocity is roughly 750 meters per second, if I remember correctly. This gun, let's just say it's better to have this gun than have no gun. Um, as you know, in real life, if somebody shoots at you, it's somewhat of a significant emotional event, as somebody has once termed it. So you want a gun on this position, yeah? You don't want this, this gunner just to, to, to sit here and see the Spitfires coming at him and he can't do anything. Even one gun is better than no gun. However, with this gun, you, you're not free really going to damage all that many enemy fighters. Maybe you can hit the cooling system, at which point most aircrafts will immediately RTB, especially if they're inline engine, you know, if you hit the, the oil or water cooling, you know, it's depending on the leak, it's it, it's just a couple of minutes that those fighters might have. So if you can do that with this gun, you essentially already have done your job. It's not really meant to shoot things down, it's meant to be a deterrent. I think that's pretty obvious. Now, the first thing that's interesting, if we open this um, canopy, actually, what I should have said is, it's interesting how it's being used because you'd think you can swing it around as as we are here, and that's not really true. We actually have to open this whole uh, rear section of the uh, the huge canopy that we have here. So we go, I'm just going to open this, and there we go. It's a little bit complicated, isn't it? I mean, let's close it again, and you'll see that it latches in place with this handle. So you open this handle, sack and you can kind of pull it rearward. And here you have the kind of resting hook, which you have to turn. So if we would close it once again, you can see, zack, you open it and it's open and it's locked in place. So that's what the gunner would have to do. If he doesn't do that and he just opens, um, well, his canopy and he starts firing, suddenly this thing can actually fall down again, and that's not a really good thing to happen. Now with this gun, of course, 
we have a nice little iron sight. There we go. And as you can see, there are a couple of markings on the ammo drum. And this is to help the gunner judge how much ammo he still has. Let's, uh, let's close this again so I can zoom in here. Uh, so you can see there, 75. And that is the maximum ammo capacity that this ammo drum has, 75 rounds, right? So we have 75 rounds, and as we start firing, it's obviously going to go around, since this is a kind of rounded ammo belt. I don't know the technical term for that. And it's suddenly we're going to be at 50, and then we're going to be at 25, and then we're going to be at zero. And this way, the, pi uh, the, the gunner can judge how much ammo he has. So let's say he has done a little bit of firing. In fact, let's do a little bit of our firing ourselves. Nice and easy. There we go. So if he wants to judge now how much ammo he still has, he just looks and he says, OK, I still have more than at least 50 rounds or more, but I do not have the full ammo load anymore. So he starts firing again. There we go. And self-explanatory once again, he's bypassed 50 rounds. He still has a little bit of an ammo load there and um, he can continue firing. Now this is helpful in some sense to the pilot, uh, to the gunner, excuse me, I keep saying pilot, but it's obviously a gunner. Um, but once you're really fighting and shooting and so on, I'm not quite sure how many of the gunners would actually check um, the ammo capacity that's still in the in the uh, in the drum. I think that's case by case essentially. Anyway, we have finished our ammo drum, and now we have to reload. And as you can see, we have a couple of ammo drums here. Now the BF One Ten E Two is equipped with twelve ammo drums, eleven stored and one already in the gun. So to reload, well, you have that little latch on top of the gun. Uh, let's see, there we can see that little uh, handle latch. Um, so once the ammo drum is freed, you can just pull it out and you put another ammo drum in. And you do that, of course, by pulling out one of the ammo drums that you have quite easy access to right in front of you. Now, these systems here are spring-loaded. So you pull one out and the next one slides in. Now, we could be firing enough ammo rounds or ammo drums here uh, to, for me to show that this kind of frees up but you know let's let's move along here you, you get the picture and um, that's it you you're gonna reload it you can start firing again now the question you might ask at this point Bismarck with 12 ammo drums in your cockpit stored like this where do they go because obviously we have full ammo drums there we have full ammo drums there where do we put the empty ones? Well, my friend, we have a little canister here. It's also spring-loaded. You push one of those ammo drums in there. Um, and as you do that, of course, the latch is open as you push, them, push it in. And then, dunk, it closes automatically. So that's where you put your empty uh, drums. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a bin, let's say. Um, and that, of course, allows you then, once you're back in base, to empty it and um, put the ammo back in again. So, yeah. Recycling was a strong feature in uh, the German Luftwaffe during the Second World War. Right, there is one last thing that I want to mention here, and that is, of course, the red handle. Most of you have seen it by now, probably. Vorsicht, Kabinenabwurfhebel. Uh, essentially, you jettison the uh, rear part here of the, uh, the canopy, and that way the gunner can then bail out very, very easily. Okay, so moving forward to our right side, we have the oxygen. Yeah, Sauerstoff, that's the German word for oxygen. And to the left side, we have a couple of electrical systems. Um, I'm not quite sure if you can actually read that here, but if you're German, you might pick out some of those words. Uh, we have uh, Kühler, Verstärker, we have uh, Messgeräte, Generator, Kursteuerung, Heizbekleidung. I mean, there, there's kind of everything in there. Um, there's a little bit of heating in there. There's a couple of other electrical systems and so on. Um, so obviously, since they're easy access for the uh, for the gunner here, for the observer, as you might want to call him as well, uh, he's going to be using them. Okay, swinging back around. All right, so before we actually did that, I uh, made a little bit of a turn. This way the sun shines into the area that I want to explain, and that's obviously going to help you guys from seeing what I am actually talking about. Uh, what are we talking about first? Uh, the ammo drums or... No, let's talk about the dashboard first and let the, the boom boom stuff uh, for later. Uh, so we have a clock on the dashboard here. It's uh, 20 to 1 p.m. more or less. 
Uh, so yeah, that's good to know. Um, then you have a homing, homing indicator. That's obviously uh, important for navigation. Uh, then you have your ultimate, altimeter. Is that? I always have problems with this this word in, in English. Altimeter. Well, your altitude meter. Okay, that's it. Then you have your speed. And then you have your uh, indicator for the cannons. Now the cannons. The the pilot actually also has one of those indicators. You can barely make it out over his shoulder there. Uh, but uh, yeah, both of you guys have a an indicator for the cannons, how many rounds there are still in there. And uh, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later on. And then here you have a compass and essentially your radio bearing uh, indicator. So obviously that is also important if you wanna do any kind of navigational stuff. And over here you have a crank that allows you to lower and raise your aerial. Now, these four slash five boxes. Wow. Okay, this is a little bit complicated because this is the radio. Yeah, this is the FUG 10, Funkgerät 10, FUG or FUG 10. People tend to give different names to it, but yeah, the abbreviation is FUG 10. Um, now, the Germans built quite a few versions of these. There is the FUG 10, there's the FUG 10P, uh, the FUG uh, 10K1, then there's the K1P, the K2P, the K3P, K4P. You get the picture. Uh, some of those are specialized versions. This is kind of the standard FUG 10, but depending on which one you have, you have little differences in frequencies and so on. Now, as you can see, there are letters printed or stamped into these boxes. There's EK, EL, SK and SL. The question is, what do those mean? Are they just code for something or... Well, let me explain to you. E stands for Empfänger. That's the German word for uh, receiver. S stands for Sender, which is the German word for transmitter. K stands for Kurzwelle, which is the German word for uh, short, short, uh, short wave. And L stands for uh, Langwelle, which is long wave. Exactly. This should make it very obvious what we're talking about here. Over here we have the uh, receiver for shortwave and over here for longwave. Over here we have this uh, transmitter for shortwave and over here for longwave. Now with this FUG10 uh, you can have Bord zu Bord and Bord zu Boden. That's, that's German essentially for plane to plane or plane to ground. Uh, so it's a versatile little machine and it gives the BF-110 exactly what it needs, yeah? Communicating with wingmen or other flights and of course with the ground forces. Now you can see the frequencies on the top here for the receivers and uh, over there it's set to what is a 3700 kilohertz and over here it's uh, 370 megahertz. As I said, depending on which version is this, it's gonna change in kind of what kind of frequency intervals you can actually work. Okay, moving on to the Ammo drums here. Now you might be wondering why are these here? Now I actually made a dedicated video only about these ammo drums because the gunner can reload the cannon. Yes, that's right. The BF-110 gunner reloads the cannons, which beefs up the offensive armament and the longevity a BF-110 can stay in the fight for a long, long time. Um, all these ammo drums have 60 rounds and as you can see, once again, we have nice little markings telling us how many rounds there are in there. So we have 60 starting there and there. Why is that like at five o'clock? If you imagine a clock there at five o'clock, then you have 50 at roughly 12 o'clock, 40, 30, 20, 10, and then it's empty. Um, these are reloaded into the guns over there. I'm not gonna talk exactly how it's done because I already have a video about that. You can check that out. Um, but suffice it to say, the uh, as you can see, you have three ammo drums here, two of Two of them, actually the ones in the middle are already essentially charging the gun, but you have three there, you have three there. Um, if you do the math, yeah, you have 120, 240, and then you have 360 rounds of 20 millimeter ammo. And of course you have also here a little bit of a bin. Um, so yeah, that is essentially the rundown for the gunner position. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. And uh, if you have anything to add, please do in the comment section below.
And uh, as always, I would like to thank all of you for joining me today. If you feel like supporting these videos, uh, please do check out my Patreon, since uh, that is essentially the best way in supporting my channel. I hope you guys have a great day, good hunting, and see you in the sky!